Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today, we have a very special, special video for you. Uh, lately, I've been doing these very long, drawn out, uh, this is not a top 10 ranked video, and uh, my throat was having a hard time hanging on because uh, I've been a little under the weather these last three weeks. I am uh, getting better. I'm feeling a little bit better, but my sense of smell is still not back, so I can't do any early impressions. Well, it comes and goes. I, sometimes I smell and I think, wait a minute, I think I can smell something and then it's gone. So I don't know if it was the COVID or just this cold that I have or what, but um, hopefully my nose is back to 100% soon so I can do these early impression videos for you guys. I have so many samples and new fragrances I can't wait to discover and I'm just like, ah, oh, come on, come on nose, let's go. But um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a ranked perfumers portfolio video on one of the greatest of all time, the one and only Pierre Bourdon. What a story he has. Um, so first of all, let me just talk about these perfumers portfolio videos as a whole. Um, the whole idea was to pay homage, uh, give a shout out to the people behind the bottles and fragrances and scents that we know and love. And, um, you know, many times going back to the old fragrances that uh, if you're a vintage fragrance lover like like I am, you'll know that in the old days, many people didn't even know that a perfumer existed. They thought it was Calvin Klein uh, or Tommy Hilfiger actually making the fragrance. They didn't realize there were perfumers behind the scenes even. So interestingly enough, they started to get this... Uh, you know, I think they started to get put in the spotlight when Frederick Maul decided he was going to put the perfumer's name on the bottle when he launched his brand, uh, Additions de Parfums uh, Frederick Maul. And, um, you know, it, he kind of, I think, viewed uh, himself more as a, um, maybe not an author, but maybe like a proprietor of a library where he kind of put all these books together and the authors who wrote the books deserve to be uh, given a shout out. They deserve to be honored. They deserve to be, you know, um, they deserve to be recognized at least. And I completely agree, 100% agree. Uh, and so this whole perfumer's portfolio video idea stemmed from that. And many people on YouTube don't go as deep as I do. I know I go deeper than the average bear when it comes to this kind of content, but that's what I hope makes my channel special and different from the other channels that are out there. And um, so I decided, you know what, I'm going to go back and rank some of these videos. So I did Gerard Anthony first, who's one of my favorite perfumers of all time. Uh, he is just a, uh, some of his fragrances, like I wore Akitos before I kind of lost my sense of smell recently. And that was just brilliant. I loved every second of it. I'm so glad I have a bottle of that. Hollow Juice. And um, then I did one on Anique Minardo. And the one I did on Anique Minardo left a little bit of a sour taste in my mouth because literally a week after I did that ranked Anique Minardo perfumers portfolio video, I got this. And um, this is Amouage Figment Man, by the way. And I think that this is her best work. I think this would be number one if I redid that video. So I kind of took a break. You notice I haven't ranked any of these perfumers portfolio videos as of late. Um, I will talk about this fragrance on the channel. You will hear more about this. I was, I, I can admit a mistake. I was a fool for overlooking this. Actually, I didn't even overlook it. I sampled it and didn't like it uh, when it first came out in 2017 and decided it wasn't for me. And I never skipped Amouage fragrances between the years about 2014 to 20, to whenever Christopher Chong left. I, bl I blind bought everything. Uh, and so what a mistake that was. But I'm so glad I got to revisit it. I'm so glad I got an older bottle where the name's on the side and the collar, not down here because there's reformulation rumors. But because of that experience... I kind of paused on these ranked perfumers portfolio videos because I was like, shit, I really don't want to make that mistake again. I mean, I could just reshoot the damn video and put that number one where it belongs uh, on the Anique Minardo list. But um, I, uh, you know, I, I wanted to give it some time, give it some time to settle. 
And so today we're going to do Pierre Bourdon. Now, Pierre Bourdon is another perfumer that um, there's been some new stuff added to the list since when I did my original video on him that's unranked. And he has a lot of controversy around him. Many could consider him to be the greatest perfumer of all time. Big words, I know. But there's a book you can read about it called The Ghost Perfumer. And, um, you know, he, long story short, without really going into the details of the book, because you should buy this and, and you can see I even highlight, I highlight when I read. Um, but, you know, if you've never read this, and you want the Cliff Notes version, I would I would say, in a, in a nutshell, Pierre Bourdon had a, an issue with his father where he never got any acceptance. He never got, you know, the, um, he never got the recognition from his old, from his old man that he thought he deserved or that he yearned for as a son, I guess. And so whenever he would create a formula and it wouldn't get, you know, he would, they would go through these long, drawn out uh, competitions where they submitted their briefs and, you know, the perfumers went head to head. And whenever he had a brief that kind of got rejected, instead of trying again, he just thought, oh, I'm not good enough and kind of threw it, threw it away. And that's when Olivier Creed kind of swooped in and started to pick up some of these genius formulas, which are many cents on this list, on the basically pennies on the dollar for nothing, almost like promises of future riches that never materialized, right? That's the story in the book. Read it yourself if you want the real deep details about it all. But um, basically, Olivier Creed um, finagled these scents, and the way that... Uh, the way that Pierre Bourdon justified it is, well, they're sitting in a drawer. They'll never see the light of day. At least this way, my work, because think about it. He has this guy coming into him saying, I see the br brilliance in your work. I'm the one that sees the genius of what you do. No one else does. Let me put that formula to use. And he did. Uh, and so at the end of the book, interestingly enough, Gabe Oppenheim says that something along the lines of they should replace the three-plumed uh, crest with Pierre Bourdon's face because it's really the house that Pierre Bourdon built for Creed. And I, and I, and I kind of have a little bit of a chuckle because he's right. When you think about these fragrances, I'm going to show you many of these that I'm attributing to Pierre Bourdon. Uh, they don't say Pierre Bourdon on any of the search engines. If you go to Parfumo or something, many of them are just blank. There's nothing there, but it's common knowledge that they are Pierre Bourdon scents. Let's put it that way. So I'm taking a little bit of liberty on some of these, uh, but I'm not going too far. There's still a lot of other fragrances in the Creed lineup that I have a sinking suspicion that it is a Pierre Bourdon scent, but I'm not including it because I'm not as sure. These, they've kind of been mentioned in the book here and there as well. Uh, and just from my nose, I would really guess they were Pierre Bourdon's. And there's some notes that show up in other of his fragrances as well that we're going to talk about that kind of repeat on some of these Creed fragrances. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. So buckle in. This won't be a super long video because it's only a top 15 this time. 15 Pierre Bourdon fragrances. Uh, and let's do scent of the day as is customary. So today, since I've been having this nose issue, I figured, you know what? Let me wear something that is stronger. And so what I did is I wore an amouage, and uh, I still hardly couldn't couldn't smell it. Uh, it's a memoir man, and this is a tester that I got long ago. I'm glad I got it. Look at the dent that I've put in this. I know I always talk about, I don't know if you can see it, but the juice is right there. I know I talk about the dent that I've put in something like imitation man and stuff like that, but uh, memoir man, I put a hell of a dent in this, and I love this scent. See, I can kind of smell it right now. That's why I'm thinking maybe it's COVID. It's kind of weird, but, um, and check this out. Amouage sent this to me when I, the last time I made a purchase from them for free. What did I buy? Uh, oh, it must have been Boundless. When I bought Boundless in 2021, they sent me this. Memoir Bath uh, Shower Gel, 300 mils, and it's pretty cool. It's, um, so I use this today. And I'm rocking the Memoir Man uh, juice. It's it's good stuff. I'm a I'm a big fan. By the way, that's a Karine Vinchon Spanner. She will get her own ranked perfumers portfolio video very soon. 
But uh, this is this amazing mixture of green, uh, uber green, almost like Dr. Imagine like Dr. Seuss green. Imagine you're looking at like green eggs and ham green. It's that kind of fairy tale green in my head when I smell Memoir Man. But there's also this very grounded, masculine, traditional lavender uh, with, of course, that beautiful Emoage frankincense and this very woody, um, smoky base. Uh, beautiful fragrance, extremely original and artistic. And I think this is the first fragrance that uh, Karine did for Emoage in 2010. This was, She was a very young gal at this point, maybe just out of her training, uh, but she nailed this one. Very artistic Emoage. Uh, might put you off if you're not used to smelling niche fragrances. It's a, it's a little bit strange. It's a little bit different. Uh, it, it really reminds me of uh, driving through like an enchanted forest. Uh, it, it's that kind of vibe, you know. It's it's that kind of, I said Dr. Seuss earlier, it's that kind of fairy tale vibe. It's like you're in a artistic landscape, a forest green artistic landscape, and it's beautiful. I love it. Uh, so that was my scent of the day. So let's get started on this top 15. Number 15 is going to be a fragrance that I do not have a full bottle of, but I do have a decant, and uh, I will do an early impression of this fragrance, let's say. It made the video yesterday on Violet Flowers, by the way. It's uh, Davidoff's Good Life for Men. So Good Life for Men is one of those long-lost designers. By the way, I have to thank Anuj at Enchante for sending me this decant of, again, this hollowed juice. Uh, Good Life for Men is uh, this very fresh green scent, and it has an interesting fig leaf note. And fig leaf can sometimes come across as fruity, but also a little green, sour green. Uh, and there's this, there's this um, fruity black currant that mixes with it. So it definitely has this fruity, fresh opening. And the thing about Pierre Bourdon, and I'll touch on it later when we get to the number one spot, because if you know me, you know it's going to be number one. There's no question about it. Uh, he always had this uh, ability to try to master a certain genre. And with the first fragrance he released in the early 80s, it was like the very first one he mastered it. And then he got obsessed with finding the perfect freshness. And you saw that DNA show up over and over and over again. There's a fragrance that I don't have of his called Cool Water that was probably his biggest seller. Uh, it, it had to have been his biggest seller. So I've never, um, well, I had a bottle of cool water when I was very young. I think my father bought it for me sometime in the 90s. So I must have been 10 or 11 or something when I had that. Uh, and so I have had a bottle of cool water. I don't have one right now. But that freshness is what you get from many of his uh, fragrances once you get later on down his fragrance creating career. And this is one such fragrance. It's a very fresh, easy to wear. I would wear this in the same vein. So another fig fragrance I really love wearing is uh, Dior's Dune Pour Homme, okay? Uh, I would wear this in the same time frame and state of mind. And you know, when you're kind of wanting that fresh, easy to wear, summery fragrance, it, it has that feel to it. Uh, but it does have this very relaxing uh, almond, amber, clover, sandalwood, and tea base uh, with an interesting floral heart with some lemon. And there's this melon aldehyde in the top, which his master, uh, Edmund Rudnitska, used uh, to perfection in fragrances like uh, Parfum, uh, Le Parfum de Therese, which I just talked about yesterday as well in the Violet video, I believe. Uh, and that's a new fragrance to my collection, but I'm very excited about getting to know that. And if you've ever smelled Ocean Rain by Mario Valentino by Edmund Runitska, that uh, melon aldehyde note you see over and over and over in Pierre Bourdon's work. And it was something that Edmund Runitska also uh, really fashioned himself an expert at using. I think you find it also in um, Dior's Chipra, Diorella, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so it's there. It's in good life. So that's one of those designer fragrances that while it's it's good, 
it's discontinued. It's very hard to find. I don't think it's worth the three, four, five hundred bucks it's going for nowadays on the secondary market. Maybe if you could find a bottle for a hundred, but that would be, you know, good luck with that. Uh, a partial would be cool, but again, those are hard to find. So good life comes in at number 15. Number 14 is another fresh fragrance. I like this one a little bit better. This is very easy to wear. I enjoy, I wear, I wore this a couple times last summer and I really enjoyed it. This is uh, from YSL and this is called Live Jazz. So there's the bottle. It's a flanker of the uh, original Jazz, which is one of my favorite fragrances of all time. I have three bottles of that, thank God, in the old piano, uh, black and white piano key bottle. And I love the original Jazz. It's, it's definitely, if I was ranking the Jazzes, uh, Jazz would be number one, then Jazz Prestige. Live Jazz would be last, but this is still a great fragrance for the, for the heat. For warm weather, when you want something refreshing, there's this beautiful bittery, um, it's like this bitter lemon grapefruit with a little bit of mint in the opening. Uh, and there's rhubarb leaf as well, which is a very interesting note. Um, sometimes you'll see rhubarb in perfume and it dries down to this ambery, cedary, ambery vanilla. Okay, so think about designer, woody, uh, easy to wear, dry downs, it has some of that. Uh, so it's not just lemons and freshness, there's a little bit more to the base, but to be honest with you, it probably lasts five or six hours, right? It's You just reapply throughout the day. It's one of those fresh citrusy scents, and it has that Pierre Bourdon freshness about it that he really tried to master for the rest of his career after he uh, you know, kind of released the, one of the greatest animalic scents of all time. So Live Jazz, 1998, another discontinued designer that's very hard to find and very expensive. Again, I don't think this is worth three or 400 bucks, but if you can find a deal, or if you're a collector like me and you just want to have it in your collection, uh, this is one to be on the lookout for. Live Jazz by Yves Saint Laurent. Uh, this is, uh, this is distributed by Sanofi, just to give you an idea of the timeline. Sanofi Beauty is the distributor. Okay, so that was number 14. Number 13 is going to be a, I think, a very underrated um, Pierre Bourdon creation. And this is where we start getting into kind of the details of the story and how deep you can really take this rabbit hole and why I think, I mean, I know Pierre Bourdon's a genius just from listening to him talk. Uh, there's a beautiful two-hour interview he did. I forget where uh, the website that it is, but if you're really interested in seeing that interview, if you send me an email, I will send it to you. I can't post it. YouTube would take it down. But um, there's an amazing interview that he gave where he talks about his life and career and some of it's kind of in the book as well, The Ghost Perfumer, but hearing him talk about it is just something else. Um, and one of the scents that he created in 2006 is called Fere for Men by the house of Gianfranco Fere, uh, one of the most underrated houses. They have a fragrance called Fere for Man, which is from the 80s, which is just an amazing scent. I love Fede for Man. If you're an 80s lover, that's one to definitely put on the list. So it can get a little confusing, Fede for Man and Fede for Men. But uh, this is a little 7 mil mini I was able to score. And um, this is kind of like, uh, this is 2006 we're talking about, okay? So put yourself in the 2006 mindset. What was popular in 2006? What just came out that blew the market away? Dior Homme. Dior Homme came out in 2005, okay? Uh, Olivier Polge created the original Dior Homme, which smells like a Chanel. It smells like his father, Jacques Polge, created it while he was at Chanel, but uh, that's a topic for another video. Uh, but Fede for Men is this floral woody scent that gives off this you know, iris, apparently there's a black iris note in here, which I've seen before, but I can't say I know the difference between black iris and iris. Um, and there is this iris leaf note. So there's iris leaf and iris. It will definitely remind you of uh, Dior Homme a little bit. 
Uh, but what makes this so interesting is this is one of the many, 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 many fragrances that have a pineapple note in the top. And so again, if you want to really go down the rabbit hole, uh, his student, Jean-Christophe Herreau, created Aventus, the most popular pineapple fragrance uh, of all time, basically. And he did it for the house that, you know, Pierre Bourdon was basically uh, supporting as a ghost perfumer. No one knew Pierre. I mean, maybe a couple people on the inside knew Pierre Bourdon was the perfumer of many of these creeds. Uh, and they knew that Olivier Creed was not a perfumer, right? But most of the world buying these scents did not know that, right? So again, if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, you can get really deep with this line of thought because Pierre Bourdon probably did somewhere between 15 and 20 fragrances that have pineapple top notes. It was one of those fresh, fruity, he was obsessed with finding the perfect freshness, right? And it was one of those fruity openings that he kind of got obsessed with and he thought it would be the next big thing. And remember, pineapple wasn't anything new. You could go back to uh, Lapidus Pour Homme from 1987 uh, that had a pineapple note in the opening, the original pineapple for men. And, you know, it's, it, it is an interesting thought process when you go down the, the rabbit hole thinking about it because this is like a take on Dior Om. It's, it's got these floral, uh, modern masculine touches, but it does have that Pierre Bourdon DNA about it. Beautiful bergamot in the top. That pineapple note, it's a, it's a, I think this is a great fragrance that no one talks about. If you like, um, you know, if you like uh, Prada Loam, Prada's take on Iris, or even Prada Loam Intense, there is a little bit uh, of heft to this. It's not all just, you know, uh, ethereal Iris and florals. There's some uh, patchouli, there's tonka, there's sandalwood, there's vanilla, there's vetiver, there's oak moss, there's musk, and apparently there's ambergris, or whatever they were using for ambergris back then. This was not an expensive fragrance. Um... And, but it has that, again, Pierre Bourdon freshness, but that pineapple in the top really gets you thinking, gets the gears turning, you know, what an influential perfumer he was. You almost have to put an asterisk next to Aventus and write in Pierre Bourdon as a, uh, as a huge influence, okay? Maybe not, maybe not giving him credit for the scent itself, but training Jean-Christophe Hero, who, who was his uh, the person who created it, and of course also training Julian Rasconet, who did Royal Oud, right, for Creed as well. Uh, and so you think about just the influence he had. I still want to know who did Viking. I want to know who did the original Viking. And there's still many Creeds that I'm not 100% sure who did it. But uh, again, if you like Prada Loam, if you like uh, Dior Alm, if you like uh, Valentino Womo Intense, I would urge you to try this. Uh, it's discontinued now, so it's not as easy to find. Don't pay an arm and a leg for it, but if you find a mini or something like this and you're, and you're interested in kind of exploring your scent palette, give Fede for Men a try from 2006. Okay, next on the list, we've got number 12, and there's another interesting connection here, which we'll talk about very soon. So, this is a fragrance called Full Choke. And as you can see, I've worn this. This was a sample that was sent to me by Rich Mitch. I haven't done a video on it yet, but I will before this juice runs out. Full Choke. Uh, I wish I could smell. Um, Full Choke is a discontinued, again, discontinued fragrance by the house of Francesco Smalto. And uh, they have three discontinued fragrances that I really, really like. This is one. I don't know if I'd buy a bottle like it, but I do really like it. Uh, and of course, uh, Smalto Pour Homme is my favorite from the house. And then uh, they did a fragrance called Malto Smalto, which is a beautiful lavender and sandalwood combination. And this is a take on a spicy, woody, uh, fragrance that has some very, very interesting notes. So again, you get the pineapple. So this was 2006, Fede for Men. We were talking about the pineapple. This was 2004. So we're going back, we're turning the clock back even a couple years earlier. And there's a note in here of gunpowder. 
So on the top, you get pineapple and gunpowder. And if you know your creeds, you already know what I'm thinking here, okay? You're probably already a couple steps ahead of me. I don't want to give it away yet because it's much higher on the list. But uh, there's a creed. They used a gunpowder accord. And interestingly enough, in the Ghost Perfumer, uh, they talk about the fact that the head honcho of Dior that uh, allowed Pierre Bourdon cr to create his Dior fragrance because it was always his dream to create a fragrance at Dior, right? And um, I forget his last name. I think his first name was Roger. He was a perfumer too, I think. Uh, but he was in poor health. And so they had this idea uh, to create a fragrance with a gunpowder note. And apparently uh, the story was is that he ended up, the person that, you know, a lot was there was the head of uh, creative director marketing or whatever it was, creative director at Dior, whenever um, Pierre Bourdon created his fragrance for... Um, Dior, which I wonder, I, I can't, Dolce, is it called Dolce Vita? I think it was called Dolce Vita in 1999. And um, so whenever he created Dolce Vita in 1999, he kind of had this secret handshake agreement with Dior that more sense would come, right? And um, one of the, uh, I'm trying to think about the guy's name, Roger something, it's not coming to me, but but, um, you know, he had this handshake agreement to create more sense of Dior, right? Which, which didn't come. With that gunpowder accord was an interesting idea that they had. Well, Creed got one of the gunpowder fragrances, and this was another iteration, I think. That's my guess, if I had to guess, that, um, you know, Full Choke ended up being this spicy, woody, there's uh, Sri Lankan cardamom, Russian coriander, honeydew melon, interestingly enough, uh, Vietnamese white pepper, ambergris, Jamaican rum, musk, Indonesian teakwood, vanilla, java vetiver, and leather. I really like this. I've worn it a couple times, or at least I've had a chance to spray it a couple times, and I've enjoyed it. Uh, you know, if a bottle showed up at the right price, I, I very well may pull the trigger. The bottle is completely insane. In the book, uh, they actually attribute it to uh, supposed to be like this phallic symbol, like looking like a dildo. Um, and that's what they say the bottle is actually supposed to be. Someone else tells me, no, it was supposed to be like a gear shift or something like that. Or, you know, I, I don't know what, uh, what, what the correct answer is. But if you look at the bottle, it is, uh, it's, it's probably one of the most insane bottles you'll ever see. Don't leave that bottle sitting out on your counter. Let's, let's put it that way. So full choke comes in at number 12. Number 11 could easily be number one on most people's list. Uh, and this is Creed's Millicene Impidial. Now, Millicene Impidial, I think, came out uh, a year or two or right around the time that his mentor, uh, the person who trained him, died, passed away, Edmund Runitska. Uh, and so Millicene Imperial, I feel like, is kind of the last uh, fragrance that you really see from Pierre Bourdon, which really borrows a lot from, you know, Edmund Runitska's style. Once you get past that, once you get past this year 1996 is it yeah 1994 1994 i'm sorry um 1994 so once you get past this you really start to kind of see pierre bourdon go in his own way but uh this really does feel like a continuation is this leaking holy shit yes it is it is leaking all right um so this bottle if i've never shared this with you this bottle is, it's actually a bottle that the juice has turned inside. Uh, and let me just show you real quick here. So you can tell it's a legit Creed. It's not a fake. It's just that it's turned. This is a very old version of Millicene Impidial. They, um, so I don't know if you can see, let's see, maybe you, yeah. But what they did back in the day 
is they used to have the bottles like this all in uh, gold, in, in gold. And then if you look at many of the vintage bottles that uh, people would, would buy who were vintage hunters, you wouldn't see these gold bottles. You would see the ones that were clear with the gold kind of label on the front. Um, and I had a full 120 mil bottle of that. I used the entire thing. So I'm very familiar with the scent. And I had, I think my bottle was like 2011 or 12. So it was, it was kind of an older bottle. Um, and so, um, the reason I bring that up is it's now gold again. So if you look, the 50 and 100 mil Millicene Imperial bottles are gold. Uh, they're back to being gold. So when people see this, a lot of times they think it's a new bottle. It's not. If you take a look, you'll see it's a 75 mil bottle. But the juice inside is turned. It's not so turned. I mean, you probably could wear it, but it's it's real paint thinner in the opening. It really does not smell good. It smells rotten for the first 30, 45 minutes. Maybe on a strip, if you come back an hour or two later, you can get some of that Millicene Imperial DNA, but I wouldn't wear it. But... I do have a modern um, sample of Millicene Impidial, so I will do a video on it. Maybe when the weather gets hotter in 2023, I'll do a video on Millicene Impidial and give you, give you my thoughts. It's probably one of the most, it was probably one of, um, in the 90s, the fragrances that put Creed on the map. Again, in the 80s, they had Green Irish Tweed, which is much higher on this list. That's also a Pierre Bourdon. And Millicene and Pidial in the 90s also kind of put them on the list, gave them some real clout because Puff Daddy, who was very popular, P. Diddy, uh, he, um, you know, Puff was very, uh, he was very vocal about saying how much he loved Millicene and Pidial, and it was his signature scent, and and on and on and on. And there is this fresh citrusy bit about it. It opens up very fruit, fruity and musky and somewhat aquatic. It was perfect scent for the 90s. Uh, and there's a there's a violet leaf. Actually, this, this could have been on the violet leaf video. I don't think I showed it on the violet leaf video. But um, so, so yes, I just use this as a prop now because the juice is basically turned. But I will do a video on it. And uh, Millicene and Pidial, for me, comes in at number 11. Number 10. Number 10 is going to be a fragrance that you either love or hate. I love it because of the version that I have. Uh, I've smelled the, the new juice, and I, I don't think it's as deep. I don't think it's, I don't think it's as good. I don't think it has as much complexity. And it's just more, the new version is much more about the sweetness. Don't get me wrong. This is a sweet fragrance and it is a beast. You talk about beast mode fragrance. This is one of the all time great uh, beast mode fragrances. This is Yop Om. Now, if you look in Parfumo, Yop Om is credited to Michel Almarac. Pierre Bourdon specifically states he created this. So I'm, I'm crediting it to him. Even though he's not listed as the perfumer, Michelle Almarac did. I think they worked together at Fragrance um, Fragrance Resources. I don't know. I, don't, I forget what, what firm they worked at together. But um, they did work together. And um, so I'm, I'm going to credit this to Pierre Bourdon because he specifically said I created Yop Ohm. Uh, and Yop Ohm is this huge, sweet oriental. You know, you're, you know you have COVID when you can't smell this shit. Um, Yop Ohm is uh, this gigantic, some people absolutely despise it because it is so sweet and vanillic. Uh, but what I really like about this is the cinnamon, the way that the cinnamon blends with the heliotrope. And so imagine you have this vanilla with this spongy, play doh -y. My daughter was actually playing with some Play-Doh earlier. Had some in my hand. That's a perfect representation. You just take that Play-Doh and squeeze it. That's a perfect representation of the way that the thickness of the Tonka and Heliotrope kind of comes together in this fragrance. And it's a great winter fragrance. The pink juice. If you take a look, the one that you want to get, and again, I will stand by this. Uh, this is my take. This is my two cents, okay? So if you buy this and hate this, I'm sorry. But I can only be honest with you, the one that I would recommend you to buy if you're interested in getting to know this fragrance is the one that has the little tree right here. The new Yop Ohms. First of all, they just moved it up. 
So instead of om yop, it says yop om. The om is underneath the yop. And uh, the juice is sickly pink on the new ones, like lots of pink. See how this is more like dirty pink? Um, and I don't think it says eau de toilette right here. I think it just says yop om on the new ones. And if you flip it over to the bottom, you will be able to see that the older bottles say Lancaster. That's what you want. You want the Lancaster distributor, in my opinion. Um, the new ones by Coty, much more sickly sweet. And I could totally see why someone who only tried the new one would hate it, okay? I hate sweet fragrances. You guys know that about me for the most part. Uh, I am not a fan of sweet fragrances. I love vintage Yop Om. It almost came in at number nine, but uh, again, one of these little glitches in the matrix took place again because there was also a fragrance for Creed that also smells strikingly similar to Yop Om, and we know that Pierre Bourdon uh, was the ghost perfumer for Creed for a long time. So this only makes sense that he created this scent. And this is called Original Santal. So number nine is Original Santal because Original Santal takes that Yop Om DNA. And if you smell these two side by side, if you're just like a casual fragrance, uh, if you're not like a connoisseur, if you're just someone that occasionally likes fragrances, and you just spray one and spray the other, you'll say, holy shit, this is like a ripoff of this. Because this came out uh, like uh, 2005, and Yop Om came out in 89. So we're talking a hell of a long time later. But I will say, so do the ingredients seem higher class in Original Santal? Yes, they do. Do, uh, does Original Santal have an have a advantage? that Yop Ohm does not. Yes, it does. The advantage that Original Santal, and you can see the dent. This is my second bottle of Original Santal, by the way, I should mention. I've already gone through an entire bottle, um, <clears throat> and it was a 75 mil like this. This is my second 75 mil bottle. Is the, the, um, the advantage that Original Santal has is that Creed is known for making, uh, they're popular for making very popular fresh fragrances and in the opening of original santal whereas yop om almost kind of there is a little bit of orange blossom in yop om which tries to give it a little freshness but it's really swallowed up by those heavier resin you know oriental vanillas and the heliotrope and stuff like that whereas original santal does give you a little bit of freshness it gives you a little bit of orange tree absolute and ginger with lemon and so it opens a little fresher. Uh, they've also added lavender and uh, rosemary and peppermint. The base is still, you know, almost. I mean, it's that vanillic woods with benzoin and, and musk. And Creed claims Mysore sandalwood. And they claim um, ambergris, okay? Which, whether it's real ambergris or whether it's Creed's, ambergris concoction that's supposed to just smell like salty ambroxan who knows but do i like this fragrance yes i do and again i hate sweet fragrances but i can wear this there's something about this that is alluring it's unique it's different this is a 2016 bottle so you can see right here 16 co1 uh, this is the old 75 mil bottles now they're in 50 and 100 mils i've never smelled the new 50 and 100 mils uh, but again, I hear that there has been reformulations. So if you want uh, to go for creeds, my, rep my advice is to always go for the older ones. Go for the time when they did 75 and 120 mil bottles, if you can. Usually the price will be jacked up because people know what they have. But, um, you know, there there's a little more freshness to this, and, and that's why I gave it the... The nod, it's a little easier to wear in more situations, but it still does really give you that Yop Ohm vibe. So, all right, let me put this away. Go back to your home original Santal. I'm gonna take an intermission and take a sip of water. By the way, speaking of intermissions, 
let's take an intermission and do a quick unboxing because I forgot all about this. Um, and this will be a quick one. This is only one, you know, just a quick unboxing here. All right, let's see what we got. What is this? Is this even ma is this even a fragrance? Ah, yes it is. I see what she did there. Hey. There's supposed to be two of these in there. Ah, she stuck them both in one. Okay, cool. I'm happy. So this is well, let me make sure I'm happy because it's supposed to be a specific one. Is it the one that I want? I think it is. I think it is. <clears throat> Good. Okay. Here, let me show you. So what I got. Oh, I put the old, I put the new one away. Gosh darn it. All right. So what I did. If you've been following my channel, you know that <clears throat> I bought a new bottle of Noir Peace, Noir a piece, Noir Pieces by Frederick Maul, and I um, was not impressed, not at all, actually. I was disappointed even, because uh, it wasn't what I expected, what, reading reviews, talking to people, uh, and they said, you know, Frederick Mall has been reformulating scents ever since Estee Lauder took over. So what I did is I found a vintage Noir piece back before Estee Lauder owned them. You see, you don't see, um, you don't see on this anywhere, um, EDP France Holdings Co., which is what, what you would see on the Essay Louder versions of, of uh, Noir Piece. So I got two 10 ml uh, discovery atomizers of the pre Estee Louder Noir Piece. So once my nose is healed, what I'm going to do is I am going to do a comparison video for you guys between the new Noir Piece and the old one. Uh, and just see if there really is a reformulation or not. So that'll be a cool little video. Uh, so you go back. You go back to your home. We'll put you right up here. Where do you want to live? You can live right here for now. Okay, good stuff. I'm happy. It did come properly. I was worried one was going to be new and one was going to be old. She wouldn't send me a picture of both when I bought them. Uh, and so I just kind of rolled the dice hoping they were the same and they are good stuff. Okay, so uh, Let's get back to the video now that I've had a chance to do my quick unboxing and wet my throat So next on the list we have number eight and it it is another creed And it's another one where if you go to the database You will not see Pierre Bourdon's name in the database here, but there's no way anyone else did this This smells like a Pierre Bourdon through and through I'd be shocked to learn this was not Pierre Bourdon's work. Uh, this is called Aralfa. And this was also in the video yesterday uh, because there is a violet flower note in Aralfa. Uh, but there's a lot more going on in Aralfa. Uh, Aralfa is probably one of my favorite aquatic fragrances because even though it's an early 90s aquatic, it came out in 1992, it feels like it came out in the late 80s or, or even the mid 80s. It has cumin, an aquatic with cumin, it has cumin, it has that melon aldehyde that I was talking to you about that really, really reminds me of the way that um, Edmund Rudnitska was kind of playing with that note in Ocean Rain. This is a very interesting aquatic. These two are probably two of my favorite aquatics, the master and the pupil, okay? Uh, and this was Edmund Rudnitska's last fragrance in 1990. His final fragrance came out in 1990. Uh, and whenever I wear a Rolfa, I get hints of Ocean Rain. I do. Uh, there's something about... Now, Here's the thing. I've said that before and people kind of look at me like this. Uh, 
the new Aralfa, from what I hear, is much less on the coriander, the basil, the cumin, the cyclamen, the pepper, the piney feel. I said yesterday that this feels like you're at a beach, but instead of like sand on the beach, the forest goes right up to the water. There's a forest and then there's water, you know, there's like no beach area. And that's what this feels like. It feels like kind of blending the late 80s masculines that I uh, love so much with the 90s aquatics before, you know, Aqua de Jo came out and turned it into pure aquatic, right? That's what this feels like. And I love it for that. Uh, it does feel like you're smelling high quality ingredients. It's got that smooth Creed sandalwood in the base with uh, oak moss. You know, and I like aquatics that use oak moss. I like the green touches with the, I don't like just aquatics. So for summer wear, this is, and you can see, look at the dent I put in this. I mean, I basically worn half the bottle. Uh, so happy to have it. Probably would not buy it again once it's gone. It's the old fire hose atomizer that Creed used. Th these atomizers are brilliant. They just dump juice on you. Like, I feel like there should be a special effect every time you spray that. Uh, Aralfa is awesome. Number eight was Aralfa. Number seven, and I really struggled with putting this one um, seven or, or Aralfa seven. I ended up putting this number seven because, and only because, I knew what the vintage smelled like. I had a four ounce, 120 mil bottle of this that I bought right when I really got into fragrances. Like one of my first uh, creeds was this fragrance. Um, maybe even before Aventus, I'm trying to remember if I discovered Aventus first or this first, but it was very early in my, in my journey about a decade ago when I thought buying only the highest, like most expensive fragrances meant you were getting the best fragrances. I didn't realize that much of the, um, you know, fragrance game is about marketing and you can find stuff like Rochas Femme for 20 or 30 bucks and they're some of the best fragrances of all time. I didn't realize that back then. I was still very green. So I bought this. This is my second bottle of this and this is Creed's Himalaya. And Himalaya is uh, a very interesting fragrance because Himalaya has a gunpowder note in it. Interestingly enough, it came out in 2002. Okay. And uh, Full Choke, the one I was telling you about earlier with that gunpowder note, came out in 2004. So it's definitely an accord that, um, was his name Maurice Roger? Maurice Roger? Roger Maurice? Uh, the Dior Chief I'm thinking of? If anyone knows, let me know if I'm correct. Maurice Roger sounds correct. It just hit me there out of the blue. But, um... So this was my mistake, okay? So if you can see, look at the Creed bottle. Does it look different than the one I've been showing you lately? It does, because this was my mistake. I bought a new bottle. Uh, actually, not fair. It's not necessarily true. I bought two because I bought the original Viking in 2017 in this 100 mil format, and I loved it so much. I went, I went out and bought the 500 mil, but I made sure to get the 2017 first release juice because I was worried about reformulation, as you should be with Creed. Um, and this one, though, really let me down because I knew what this smelled like. I had like a 2010 bottle because uh, I bought it sometime in 2012. And I think I bought one that was a couple years old. I had like a 2009 or a 2010 Himalaya bottle. In the 120 mil format, it was one of the most brilliant things I'd ever smelled. It, it, it changed my life like when I smelled it. I remember thinking, my God, there is something about the opening to this, this fresh opening with woods and that gunpowder note reminded me of church. It literally had this, you know, holy water church gunpowder, you know, incense thing going on. Um... This one, while it's still very nice, and while I can appreciate the nice, you know, the the um, cedarwood, sandalwood combo that Creed did in the vintage was, I mean, I could totally see why people, and I, and I was one of those people, fell in love with Creed back then. This, it's missing. It's missing that spark. It's, it's definitely been reformulated. They've tinkered with it. 
they've tried to save money on the ingredients or I don't know what it is. That that amazing uh, feeling in the opening is gone here. It's just not here. So um, this is when I vowed to never buy another Creed in a 50 or 100 mil formula ever. I learned as like I learned my lesson. So I'll still use this. And I don't know if you can see. I can see because the light's shining in. The juice is right here. So from 2017 to now, I have used this. I, I, you know, it's a fragrance that I wear. I usually wear this in the summer, but um, I will not buy another bottle. So that's the reason it's number seven instead of eight is because I knew how brilliant that fragrance was in, when it came out in 2002. And rumor is this is Michael Jordan's signature scent, if you're into that stuff. All right, number six is a uh, Frederick Mall that if I can find a vintage pre-Estee Lauder bottle... I think I would go for it, just because the collector in me uh, is interested in it. And so this is French Lover. So I only have a little decant, unfortunately, and that's all the juice I have left. That's it. Um, but I will do a video on this before this is all gone. I promise you that. So French Lover is uh, a very interesting fragrance because... Originally, Jean-Claude Elena started working on it, and then he got the exclusive in-house perfumer job at Hermes. So, uh, Frederick Mall needed someone with some clout, you know, to put on the bottle to say, hey, you know, uh, who's who bigger than Pierre Bourdon to put on the bottle? So, Pierre Bourdon took it over and finished it. And what's very interesting about this, again, speaking of connections and going down the rabbit hole, is for me, the combination, this came out in 2007, by the way, uh, in the United States, this is called Boiderage. In Europe, this is called French Lover. Same fragrance. Uh, and it's this green, spicy, rooty. There's a, there's a big forest floor vibe that I get from this. But there's a beautiful Florentine iris, pimento, green galbanum with angelica, vetiver, cedar, patchouli, frankincense, and musk. And it's that combination of two notes. Angelica and galbanum with cedar that reminds me of Royal Oud. This reminds me of Royal Oud. Now I have a 500 ml bottle of Royal Oud. It was almost like a signature scent for me for a year there sometime uh, in 20, must have been 16 or so. I think I wore that like almost like a year straight. I love that stuff. And I killed an entire 100, uh, 250 ml um, flacon. I still have it. I'll show you guys one day. I usually grab the big 500 mil I have because it's cool and it says Royal Oud on the front. But next time I'll grab the 250 mil where you got to kind of flip it over and look at that little uh, cheap little sticker they put on the bottom that says Royal Oud. Uh, but I basically killed that 250 mil off. I mean, I wore the shit out of Royal Oud. I love it too. It's still one of my favorite creeds. And um, French Lover is very interesting because it kind of reminds me of. Uh, Royal Oud in a sense. And then when you take into account the fact that Pierre Bourdon was the master and Julian Rascanet was the student and then Julian Rascanet goes to create a fragrance that smells a little bit like a, uh, a Frederick Mall that has Pierre Bourdon's name on the bottle. I mean, the connections are just, they're insane. But uh, I do like this. I would buy a bottle but I want a pre-Estee Louder bottle. That's just, that's my new thing with Mall. I don't want to buy the new ones. Uh, the new ones I have, I like, I'll keep, uh, you know, stuff like music for a while and um, the moon and all that good stuff. Promise, I'll, I'll wear those, but no more new Malls for me. That bottle of a piece, is, a piece no, Noir pieces uh, really put me off. So we'll see if the old stuff is better. Can't wait for my nose to get better. Okay, next on the list, we have number uh, five. And this is considered one of the greatest fragrances of all time. This is a uh, collaboration with the great Christopher Sheldrake. And this is Feminita Dubois. This is actually a trio if you if you really want to add uh, Serge Luton's onto the list because he was a big part of creating this as well. And when this came out, this was a revolutionary fragrance because... Uh, they did not make fragrances for women that were woody. That was a masculine note. So there's a story that Pierre Bourdon was telling uh, where he was saying, when we were making this, people didn't understand. You know, they we were trying to explain to them it's going to be a woody fragrance. And they would say, so it's for men, right? 
He would say, no, it's for women. And it was like, they couldn't understand. How could you make a woody fragrance for women? And so originally in 1992, they released it under Shiseido. And uh, then in, in uh, what ended up happening is Serge Luton's ended up putting the fragrance into his line. Uh, and under the Serge Luton's uh, line of fragrances. And Feminita Dubois is a beautiful fragrance. It's woody, it's spicy, it's honey, beeswax, there's beautiful plum, and that cedar note is just spot on perfect. It's it's lovely. There's, the spices make it easy for a man to wear. The spices and woods, this is maybe even more masculine than feminine, but I absolutely love it. The femininity of wood. And, and if you ask perfumers, um, you know, what perfume do you wish you could have made? You'll usually get a couple answers. A couple may say Eau de Hermes. Uh, many will say Eau Sauvage or something like that. Uh, and even more will say Feminita Dubois. This is like a perfumer's perfume dream, you know, to create something like this. So, uh, this is very respected by the industry. Okay, next on the list, we've got number four. And again, this goes back to, I um, have to go off of memory because my bottle has turned, uh, but I can at least show you the presentation. This is Creed's Silver Mountain Water in the vintage format. Um, all of these, so I got this from, this. there's actually a story behind the story here. You can see it's a short ingredient list bottle and when I found this bottle, I was like, fuck, yes, I hit the jackpot, you know, because it was from Enchante. And I know his stuff is stored properly and all that stuff. And as soon as I got it, I mean, my heart just sank when I smelled it because it had turned. Like, I could tell instantly from the first time I sprayed it. And um, so it goes, this, this story always uh, goes back to what a great, you know, person Anuja is to work with because he instantly said, you know, forget about it. I'm not going to charge you for it. And I was like, well, do you want me to send it back? He's like, nah, posted to send it back uh, would be even more expensive. Just keep it. And now he, you know, has me telling that story to you guys to show his integrity. And it's true. Everything is true, though. And uh, Silver Mountain Water is, a, is, again, another one that I had a, I think I had a 75 mil of this and I used it. And then, I, you know, I was really looking forward to this. It's a shame. And I think there might've been something wrong with the atomizer because, you know, when I sprayed, it was, it, I don't know. I don't know why these creeds tend to go bad so quickly, but uh, maybe, you know, and if you, if you ask Creed, they'll always say, oh, it's the freshness of the, you know, the, the natural ingredients, the fact that I, climbed up the Alps just to get that, you know, special uh, black currant bud just for you. And, you know, they'll say some shit like that. But I still would like to know why these creeds turn so quickly. Uh, it's bergamot, mandarin, orange, neroli, marine notes, green tea, black currant bud, sandalwood, and musk. And uh, this is a, I mean, it really does give this fresh white snow, rocky marine water running down the mountain. It's just beautiful beautiful uh easy to wear beautiful fragrance that green tea note is stunning and by the way one thing that i think that i've never heard anyone else say uh so maybe i'm either completely insane or off my rocker but the green tea note if you love silver mountain water uh and that green tea note is a favorite of yours if that's you you have to try this this is Amouage, um Epic Woman, okay? I, I got this earlier this year, and I've been obsessed, obsessed with Epic Woman. I've done videos praising it. I've talked about it a lot, uh, and this is probably my favorite Cecile Zerokian creation, but the reason I bring it up is this has this tea note, and it's the closest thing I've ever smelled. You won't smell it right away. You have to wait to the mid. Once it gets to the mid and that T note comes out, it really does remind me of the T note in Silver Mountain Water. Now, this is much more about Amouage's incense and spices and uh, rose and all this stuff. But um, if you're a fan of that T note, I'm telling you, give Epic Woman a try. Even if you're not a woman, give Epic Woman a try. Okay, next on the list is probably 
uh, the fragrance that put Creed on the map in 1985. Uh, this is the one and only green Irish tweed in the vintage 120 mil, and this has not turned. This is a beautiful fragrance. Lemon verbena, or vervain, or whatever you want to call it. Peppermint, violet, uh, violet leaf. There's a little bit of that ozonic violet leaf opening. Florentine iris, sandalwood, cedarwood, and that creed ambergris. And it's got that posh, smooth sandalwood, cedarwood. Uh, Rich Mitch created a, you know, um, we now have a, a, every March 1st for the, you know, celebration of spring and being in the air. We now wear green iris tree. That's a tradition that Rich Mitch started. And um, so join me. I've joined him, I think the last couple of years now, but uh, join us March 1st, wear green iris tweed. It is beautiful. It really does feel like you're walking through an Irish countryside. It's gorgeous, posh, but that DNA is very familiar now that we're, you know, 37 years in or whatever it is. So in um, 1985 is a good year, I must say. Um, some people say, that Green Irish Tweed was kind of like, he was still working on the formula and Cool Water ended up being like the finished product, okay? That's what some people say. I love Green Irish Tweed. Um, and so for me, I don't really care. I just love wearing this. It's it's beautiful in the heat. You know, I'll, I'll wear this in the dead of summer. I don't care. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, so... Green Irish Tweed number three. Number two, and again, this is another one that is not attributed to Pierre Bourdon in the databases, but I'm going to put it out there. This, this, I mean, if anyone knows if Pierre Bourdon did not do this scent, let me know, but but uh, this is one of the most posh creeds. Again, I had an older bottle. I had a 75 mil bottle from like 2013 or something. I think it was a 2013, actually. I should have, I threw some of those old bottles out back in the day because I was like, what do you do with an empty cologne bottle? Now I wish I would have kept it. Uh, but this is Bois du Portugal. And you can see I've got the 250 mil flacon. And this actually feels like felt. I don't know if you can see it. It feels like felt. And, and it is that smooth. That's how smooth this fragrance is. Uh, the combination of lavender and sandalwood. Again, just like I was talking about Malto Smalto, lavender and sandalwood in this fragrance is absolutely stunning. And I think in 1987, Pierre Bourdon was working for Takasago, Takasa Takasago, one of the Japanese oil houses. And I think, don't hold me to this, but this is just me musing, speculating, that one of the reasons that this fragrance held up so well and did not go through reformulations is that they still are forced to buy the oils for this fragrance from Takasago. And I think they're, um, you know, I think they're still using good quality ingredients. That's my guess. I don't know. Okay. But that was one thought that came to my head because this still smells amazing. Uh, and it's woody, it's spicy. It has that smooth, creamy, milky, you know, uh, just so posh Creed sandalwood in the base that they were known for. The lavender in here is, it's so gentlemanly. This is such a gentlemanly fragrance. It really is. It's beautiful. It's a little bit of green citrusy touches in the top. It's gorgeous, gorgeous fragrance. Number two, uh, Bois du Portugal. Number one, can you guys guess what it is? Is there any doubt what number one should be? Uh, it is the one and only. Koros by YSL. Uh, and his first fragrance, you know, the the first fragrance that he put out, and this is what I was thinking about earlier, and they talked a little bit about this in the book, and I completely agree. Um, it takes a genius to master one category, never mind two, right? Pierre Bourdon in 1981, for me, mastered the animalic fragrance category. That's it. There was nothing else he could do. This is this is the ultimate uh animalic fragrance that he put out. You know, it um so someone told me recently there's no there was no real civet in this. Even these vintage um bottles uh 
even these vintage bottles uh, that go back to between 81 and 84 or whatever it was, Charles of the Ritz is the distributor of the original Koros. Even these Charles of the Ritz bottles did not have uh, real civet in them. They always used a note called Animalis. Uh, and I think it's a Simrise owned note right now, but I'm not 100% sure. But whatever was in here, I don't care. There is a, there's a brilliance in this fragrance because there's this dirtiness to it and uh, it's contrasted with cleanliness. The, the contrast here, the dichotomy between dirty and clean that you'll kind of have in your brain as you smell this, um, you know, I, I said it before, the best way to describe Koros for me is that it touches a part of the brain that we can't, uh, purposefully access, right? It's there, you know, it's there, it's ancient, like an ancient part of your brain that you can't get to, um, you know, and, and it really does smell primal. Primal is the word for this, like, uh, you know, if if you just take us back, take humans back 50, 70,000 years ago, primal, you know, that kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's that kind of fragrance. It's just insane. I, I love it. Some people say it smells like piss. I don't care. Um, you know, I think it's, I think it's a masterpiece. I think it's Pierre Bourdon's best work. And to go from creating something like this, which is the dirtiest fragrance you'll probably ever smell for some people, to then go and try to create the perfect freshness, right? With green Irish tweed and cool water and all that stuff. What a brilliant career, honestly. And, um, and then if you ever like get a chance to listen to the interview and you hear him talk, what a brilliant man. I mean, he's constantly learning. He's always reading. Um, he's just, I think he's a genius. I think he's a brilliant man. And I'm very glad to get to explore his work. It's, it's a privilege and an honor for me. Uh, I hope you guys agree with my ranking. Do let me know what your favorite Pierre Bourdons are. Leave it in the comments. Thanks for watching. I was hoping to keep this video at an hour. We're an hour and seven. So we're going to cut it here. But that's my top 15 Pierre Bourdon fragrances ranked. Let me know what yours are. Thank you for watching, everyone. Cheers, guys. And I'll see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.